very much, uh, Stefan. Well, <coughs> there you've, uh, you've, you've got the flavor of the, uh, the, the, the different ways that you can view the situation, and you've got a flavor of the, the, um, how ideology can uh, play a role in how you view the role of, for example, the role of the state and the economy and so on. Um, you also got a flavor of the sort of debate that is being held not only here in Melbourne and Australia, but um, there's a very vibrant debate, obviously, uh, in uh, Europe. Um, we have time, some time for uh, Q&A from the floor, and I would uh, encourage you to, to put questions uh, to, to the panel. So who would like to go first? Sorry. Oh, I probably don't need it. Thanks. Are you sure you yeah. Sound clear enough? Uh, my, my question is for, uh, for uh, Professor Bill, uh, uh, Bill Mitchell. You, you, you said that governments are not like family, you know, they're not like people, they can print money. I agree with that. Uh, and there's another fact, another way in which they're not like, uh, not like governments. When I die, all my debts will fall to the bank and they can fight over it and get the nothing that I'm going to leave behind. That's not the case with governments. Governments continue on and on and on, and the debt that they have accumulated continues on to the next generation. In Ireland, where, 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 where our chairman and I come from, uh, apparently when a child born now has got a billion dollars or a billion euros uh, in debt straight away. How, how do you deal with that particular problem if, if you're going to have small surpluses every year gradually accumulated to the trillions that, that uh, seem to be there today? Well, look, I'm, uh, I'm very... I, I don't own one single, uh, one single cent of the Australian government debt. There's no legal statement says I owe anything. Well, you, but you'll be paying, in Ireland you'll be paying taxes, if I understand. And I understand that, I pay taxes here too. I'm very glad that the Australian government ran deficits in the 1960s <coughs> that allowed me to go to an excellent primary school in a housing commission area, that allowed me to have very good dental care, even though my parents couldn't afford it, that allowed me to go to university on a scholarship. I'm very glad the government enriched the society with public infrastructure and prorated the costs of that infrastructure across the generations so that that generation that enjoyed it then and the next generation that enjoys the bridges and the roads and whatever can pay a little bit of it and so on. For, for public infrastructure that provides benefits over many years, even my Main Street colleagues agree, that the best form of providing it is to ensure that the costs are prorated over the benefits. It's a myth to say that I'm burdened with the debts of the past governments. I enjoy the benefits of the infrastructure. That's my answer to it. Hello. Professor Mitchell. Um, well, this is, sorry, just a second. Oh, Jason wants to come in on the same point, and then you're next. Yeah. I, I, I think that the question is, is very astute and relevant. It's a question of intergenerational uh, justice and uh, fairness, because I, I can't see how... I mean, we know how you can uh, eradicate uh, debt. Uh, Germany uh, did it uh, in the 20s and the 30s. By printing money, uh, you reduce uh, your debt, but you also destroy your money in the process. And the result is hyperinflation. But even smaller inflation can have terribly destabilizing uh, consequences. What the Irish economy experienced, I lived in Ireland uh, at the height of the Celtic Tiger, uh, was that the property prices uh, virtually, I don't know, doubled every four years or, or something. You felt like an idiot if you didn't they buy an apartment. That, 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 that is, that is uh, <laughs> one private yeah. sector. Yes, yes. There's nothing No, no, that, I, I, I'm just talking about inflation. That was private debt that was encouraged by irresponsible policies, the policies of the European Central Bank that understandably had to focus on uh, Germany and France, but it virtually printed money for Ireland, right? Uh, and, and, and that destroyed the, the housing uh, sector and it brought down the Irish economy because the state felt obliged to step in uh, where the private sector failed. That's right, it became, uh, it became public debt. That's, that's right, right. through that. It became public debt. Yeah. It didn't start that. Yes, yes, that's it's well, it's great to feel the vibrancy of the debate. <laughs> the, the gentleman yeah. there had his hand up, and then, sir, you will be next. It's interesting. I heard in, you, in the way you presented uh, a kind of exasperation. And it is really interesting that the world, and clearly people in this room, don't understand fair currencies. They don't understand nominal debt. But very little understanding of intergenerational debt. I mean, the, the shit. America hasn't paid off its Second World War debt. 
but we wouldn't ever ask for the Americans not to have raised that amount of debt in the Second World War to, to defeat the Nazis. The notion of debt being currency and nominal, and, and, the, and the sense in which all currencies are nominal, you understand that no one understands it. So how long do you think it'll be before, or what set of circumstances need to be created for the political elite and for the, and for the public discourse to get to the point that understands that this is a much smaller problem in the long, in the long run than, than it's portrayed, and as you pointed out, is a balance of payments, it is a balance of payments problem between Germany and, and the periphery. It's an interesting case study that happened at the, uh, in about 2001 in Australia. And the uh, federal government at the time had the view that they had to pay back all of the outstanding federal government debt and progressively was doing that. And uh, by 2001, the public bond markets were very thin. That means there wasn't much paper being traded. Who do you think complained? Sydney Futures Exchange was the first one to mind, and then the banks. And there was a federal government, a treasury inquiry in December 2002, and that led to the most extraordinary decision by the federal government, which was running surpluses to guarantee that it would issue every year a certain amount of public debt, which is corporate welfare, because it allowed the investment banks to price their risky assets from a risk-free benchmark. And what you learn from that example is that the government's issued debt not to fund their spending. The Australian government does not have to fund its spending. It doesn't have to fund its spending. That's not to say it should spend willy-nilly. It doesn't have to fund its spending. Debt plays a different role. And if we, if, and the other, the gentleman now I'm answering here, the, the, the fact is the governments never pay back their debt in macro sense. Of course, they, they pay the maturity when it comes up, but they, the, the debt's just there. It's no burden. The interest rates, that they can always control the interest rates and the yields to make sure it doesn't, that the interest service payments don't get too large. Japan, I mean, you know, the example I always give is if you believe in mainstream economics, then please explain Japan. <laughs> Japan has had massive deficits increasing year after year for the last 25 years, 23 years. It's got the highest gross public debt, 250% odd of GDP. It's got zero interest rates that have had zero interest rates for 20 years about. And it's got deflation. If you believe in the mainstream story, please stand up and explain Japan. <laughs> Oh, I just saw the yeah. yeah. I think we're going to the next because that's the question I want to ask. Yeah. 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 I, I don't want to explain uh, Japan. No, that's, but, that's but, for another <laughs> evening, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we're all agreeing. But when you uh, says that uh, the debt doesn't have to be paid and all that, then that assumes that bondholders are just some nasty speculators out there who are trying to make big bucks. But bondholders, in reality, are, are like whoever has a pension plan. Uh, has uh, some government problems, right? That's one of the safest investments that it used to be on quite recently. So the, the notion that governments don't need to repay it, they then... Um, no, I said in a macro sense, they, in volume sense, they never pay, mostly never pay back their debt. They pay back each of the individual debt holders when they mature, but they don't never pay back their debt. They just pay back each of the individual debt holders when they mature, but they never retire debt overall. They just issue new currency, new debt. So. I think we'll, we'll proceed with the agenda in the second row. And at this stage, I think we'll have one eye on the clock. At this stage, I'll take uh, two questions together. If that's because so many things are related to, to, to um, each other. Yeah, the second, I wanted to raise a question on just how much um, the current crisis in, in Europe has been exaggerated by the massive current account deficits of Germany raising. Um, and not redistributing across Europe as under the various treaties which it's, you know, it's expected to do. Um, and that's never talked about, really, or rarely talked about. And I mean, if you look at Japan, it, Japan, China, 
Germany are, are among the very few countries that have been regularly running massive current account deficits. That's how Japan had no, services. services. So services, I mean, how Japan protects banks to spend that big public debt. And the lady in front of you. Unless you were. Well, no, I'm happy to speak up because I got the impression that tonight we heard a lot of failures about the European Union and the Eurozone and the Euro and the member states and we are falling apart and Europe is falling apart soon and it will be solved when the Eurozone will be solved soon uh, because uh, getting together the European member states will be almost impossible. And, uh, I have this strange impression that, of course, Australia is very far from Europe. But I'm really surprised that I see that there is no any balance view here. And we had uh, both gentlemen uh, presenting just the one side, which is uh, extremely negative for the European Union, and there was no one here to speak about the European Union. Way. I'd rather say this is a failure of the academic Monash University to present a more balanced view tonight about what is happening, not only in the European Union and the Eurozone and such, but in the global uh, financial crisis, which definitely did not start it from the European Union. And my question is, um, since the last two or three years, the crisis was mainly focused on Europe or the periphery of the European Union, which is not fair. I think we should better get a more balanced view about what is happening right now. And I know it is very difficult for many, not only the Europeans, the Australians or the Americans, to understand all these terms that have gone in our minds television and the interviews and the articles we have read all these, these last years. But um, I would rather say that uh, having followed very closely the European Union, speaking about Ireland or Portugal or Spain or Greece going out of the European Union is like saying that because Queensland had some flat a year ago, we could go to Australia. This is not possible. So the question I have to raise is, if this is a European Central Bank or any kind of Eurozone problem, why do we have the British in recession by 2% lately? Why did we have this amazing social revolt that caused this London in flames a few years ago, a few months ago. As far as I know, the British have their own pound. As far as I know, they're not connected with the Eurozone, but they are in recession. As far as I know, the United States runs a 15 trillion deficit, and they are really in trouble, although they don't want to admit and do something about it like the European Union is so I would like you to explain to you why the British, who are having very serious economic problems right now, why do they have the problems since they stayed out of the Eurozone? And they shouldn't yeah. have any problems. Sorry, they should prosper and have yeah. a good financial situation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We'll take these two yeah. questions. Can I possibly? Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. 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 Um, partly, just <laughs> taking your last point, Partly, this is a big raising issue, which uh, Natalie will, will speak on. Uh, partly, it, it is uh, the nature of, of the debate uh, that there are evenings like this that are organized over a whole series of, of, uh, of period. Um, and it's partly because we haven't heard my conclusion that I will draw from this debate uh, yet, and I'm saving that myself. Um, but to your question, uh, yeah, sorry. First, the question about the fact that the new mercantilism of Germany's policies 
to ever discuss. Uh, and obviously, I think that that's not just a problem in, 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 in Australia, it's been a problem in Europe as well, but it's starting to change. More and more, in fact, German economists are themselves starting to question the fact that it was a very short-sighted policy. We delivered great results, which, as Bill explained, were to a large extent at the expense of the trading partners of Germany. Uh, and that, obviously, it's no longer sustainable for Germany. Germany is the last new mercantilist country in the world. China itself is discovering, has started to discover the fact that it's not sustainable in the long term. So I think that there are views that are starting to emerge in Europe itself, which are starting to provide a more balanced assessment, precisely, of this uh, role that Germany has played. Uh, uh, wittingly or unwittingly, I'm not going to go into that discussion, but into the, the, the current crisis, and I'm sure my colleagues will want to add to this because I'm not a Now, in terms of the unbalanced nature of the event, I think David has already answered that to a point. Uh, we have a series of events. I actually tried my best to secure the participation of a Greek economist, his name is Yanis Varoufakis, who actually argues that there is a third position to the one that Bill Mitchell described. Because Bill talked about the fact that it was basically federalism or disintegration, right? But they are, there is, in fact, other possibilities, right? Which is a measure of federalization, but not full federalization, because we know that politically federalization means a whole process of treaty renegotiation, which is just slow, especially in the European Union of 27 member states. And uh, by the time, as Yanis Varoufakis says it, by the time the treaties are renegotiated, the problems are addressed, there's nothing to federate, right? So he has actually been <laughs> formulating uh, a kind of uh, federalization using the instruments that already exist. So Bill has touched upon that, which is aligned, the, although it's anathema to somebody like Stefan, which is allowing the European Central Bank to play a fiscal role, but openly rather than through the back door, right, as it's been doing. Another uh, thing that has been discussed, not just by the Yanis Varoufakis, but also by other economists, is using the European Investment Bank to try and precisely implement a kind of, of new deal for Europe, right, to precisely start shifting some of that wealth and putting it into productive investment in the periphery, such as Greece, right, to help it you know, uh, come out of, of the crisis that it is in. So in response to this, I hope that we can deliver that event, right? but it wasn't possible this time. Uh, there's an overall right, a series of events within this centre and among uh, the other centres, and I hope that we can deliver uh, another event that will be the third option, which was not discussed tonight. And maybe even important to it. Um, I think the point about the uh, external <coughs> imbalances is clear. The, you know, I mentioned in my talk that the German model is unsustainable. Uh, you can't have export-led growth if driving everybody's growth because to have export-led growth, you must have other countries in um, the, the question, when I was invited to give this talk, I was held out to me in this debate. And as I understand that, we found it very hard. Uh, I think Stefan was meant to be the anti-hero person uh, initially, but I think it was hard to find uh, uh, the balance on the evening. But let me add that the debate is so heavily skewed towards the mainstream ideology, the financial media that the, the, the controls the communications that the citizens get, the statements from leaders, the economists coming out all the time, the debate, I am in a tiny little minority of all this. And the vast majority of views you'll get always in the spread across the media will be the pro-euro, pro-austerity. There is no balance in the world debate. This is a tiny little bit of redress. About uh, Queensland. The reason why it would be absurd that Queensland would leave Australia because of the floods, because within 24 hours, the federal government announced massive stimulus packages to bail the state out and used its fiscal authority as a national keeper of well-being in the country to make sure that the state, and same in Victoria when the bushfire, it is absolutely true. 
That's why they lost the election. It is the federal government absolutely intervening with mass, with billions of dollars to help the flood. Absolutely true. The final point I make is that Britain is in such a disaster at the moment, you correctly quoted their latest national accounts figures, because they think they're an EMU country. They think they've got a budget constraint. They think that the bond markets are about to attack them. They've imposed austerity on their economy, which has scorched their spending and undermined, undermined their growth rate at a time when the private sector isn't willing to spend because they're carrying too much debt as a consequence of their housing market boom, over boom, and the, the British government is acting as if they're the Greek government. That's the reason. Tell me why Japan, tell me why US, tell me why Australia isn't in the same situation, because we've kept our stimulus more or less. Now, I'm going to, I have, I think at this stage, one, two, three, four, five people on my list, and there are certain time constraints on us this evening. So, I'm first going to take the two gentlemen who have been waiting patiently in the second row on the right hand side. Uh, if you could, I guess the area that I've been talking about really is, is uh, I think, been referred to, and I don't think it's very useful to Thank you for raise the issue. The younger gentleman on the, at the wall. Just a clarification from earlier. You're talking about counter-cyclical spending um, by governments or anti-cyclical spending. Um, doesn't that leave room for running budget surpluses um, in, in boom times? It definitely does. So Norway runs small budget surpluses. Its private domestic sector is able to save up to its desired save. And the economy doesn't go into a downturn because they've got such strong net exports in, in North Sea Gas and North. And if a country has such strong net exports, which are bringing in demand from outside the economy, spending, then that can maintain growth at the same time as allowing the private sector, domestic sector to save and therefore withdraw some of their spending and allows the national government to drain some spending. But Norway is very unique. Not every that can't be a solution for everybody because not everybody can run run current account surpluses of the strength of Norway. By and large, most countries have historically and will continue to run small budget deficits. And it's better that they run small budget deficits by choice rather than by force of the business cycle undermining their tax base. Just, just one, one uh, uh, comment, uh, that uh, rhetoric about terrible austerity is somewhat misleading in that none of those governments are actually running surpluses. It's not about running surpluses, it's about keeping the uh, budget deficit under control. No, no, you're clearly so, not an economist because austerity means you can have a budget deficit moving from 10% of GDP to 8% of GDP, that's austerity. That's a contraction. You don't have to have a surplus to have austerity. And the fact that they aren't in surplus is indicative of the fact that they are undermining their tax budgets. Thank you very much. Now, the gentleman on the right hand side, front row, and then the gentleman on the left. Please. Now, I had a question about the democracy. Because uh, when we all talk about money and the uh, limits and all that, we see Greece in a situation where they're losing the democracy, you have the trophy coming in, the same thing happening. In and also I guess it's going to happen in Spain. Well, my question is, what is the impact of less national democracy on the economy, the entire world? Because you have less control. Okay, we're taking this with you, sir. Yes, it, it ties in slightly. Um, everybody's been discussing the end of the euro and just so far I've described it as anachor or messy and not really described how it might happen. But at a certain point when Greece or Germany, whoever leaves the euro does leave the euro, someone rather important is going to stand up and say, as of a certain date, my country is leaving the euro. I'm curious to see what date you think they will put on that. Will they name a date that's one week in the future or three months in the future or a year in the future? It does actually somewhat tie into that question because if you now announce that Greece is leaving the euro one year in the future, there will be no money in Greek banks within about six days. So how fast and how do you actually announce a country leaves the euro? Jennifer, if you allow, uh, I think these are very good questions for which to end. And if in answering the questions you also wanted to, 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 to draw the conclusions yourselves, please, please be able to do so and then I will also draw a few. Just 
on the democracy question, I'm not a political scientist, so I think I'm the political scientist here. As a citizen, I would say that, yeah, I think that the, my understanding is that the, the I think Stefan alluded to this, that the, the EMU, the Eurozone, was meant to further political integration. It was meant to sort of be a capstone on the bringing Germany back into the fold as a good citizen, not the ugly Germany. And I think what they've done by becoming overstepping and creating a monetary system that can't work is that they've actually undermined their political processes and they're now splintering. And I, you know, I think that uh, uh, the, the notion in this fiscal compact that was agreed in December where a bureaucrat can make interventions into the fiscal decisions of an elected government is pretty scary. We will tolerate it here. The, um, a, a case study for you is uh, early 2002, where in December 2001, Argentina had uh, riots in the street, it runs on the bank, the banks were closed. It had a peak currency to the dollar. It, uh, it, uh, its, its export sector failed badly because of the downturn in the rural economy. It uh, had all its uh, debts in foreign currencies, so obviously had lost its sovereignty altogether. The uh, Argentinian government then, and I, I know this very well, I had dealings with them at the time. The Argentinian government then decided to overnight close the banks. It defaulted on all its debts. It cancelled the peg, so it floated its currency and, made, and got currency, got sovereignty back. It then created what was called the Head of Households Program which was a guaranteed work for one member of each household per week. Within two quarters, that program created 670 odd thousand jobs. And within three quarters, the economy was grown quite strongly again. And within about three years, foreign, foreign uh, port, uh, direct portfolio investment was coming back in again. So they did it in a very careful way. They just closed the banks. They prevented exchange leaving. Uh, the, the question about bank runs on European banks, all the money's gone out of the banks anyway. <laughs> all, the Greek, all the Greek money's gone to Germany anyway. But what, they all did the one click on the internet some uh, two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Spaniards have been doing it too.